of uh, a uh, very well known uh, place which is the terry and so and the subject that he has chosen is earth systems and its impact on the societal uh, well being is a very important subject again i'm quite sure we'll all be looking forward to his lecture so i wish you all a great lecture and professor naik a great delivery um thank you again <coughs> over thank you. to mahanti ah many many thanks uh, sir mohanty for setting a very context setting to uh, request our vice president mr girija prasad mahapatra to kindly introduce our esteemed speaker hey, mr mahapatra thank you sir thank you sujit and president and dr naik <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce a great geo scientist of india dr sailas naik any any Dr. Shailesh Naik is currently the director of National Institute of Advanced <laughs> Studies, Bangalore, and chancellor of the Terry School of Advanced Studies. He obtained PhD degree in geology from the MS University, Baroda, uh, in 1980. He was distinguished scientist in the Ministry of Earth Science, Government of India, and president of International Geological Congress during 2015 and 17. He was the secretary to. Ministry of Earth Science, Government of India, during August two thousand eight to two thousand fifteen, that is for the seven years, and provided leadership to programs related to Earth science, system science. He has been credited with launching many research programs related to monsoon, air sea interaction, changing water cycle, atmospheric chemistry, coastal vulnerability, climate services, polar science, etc. Pet up HP system having eleven pet up clubs, capacity for weather and climate research and operation. He had restructured meteorological activities in the country, and thus improved weather and hazard related services in the country. He had set up state of the art tsunami warning system in Indian Ocean in two thousand seven in just two years time. and providing tsunami advisory to indian ocean rim countries he pioneered in development of algorithms and methodologies for application of remote sensing to coastal and marine environment and generated baseline database of the indian coast and developed services for fisheries and the ocean state forecast the generation of detailed information on the indian coast has influenced the development of policy for joining of coastal zones for regulatory regulating coastal activities he is fellow of national science academy new delhi indian academy of science bengaluru national academy of science india allahabad international society of photogrammetry and remote sensing and academician of the international academy and astronautics paris he has been awarded honorary degree of doctor of science by the andhra university in 2011 assam university in 2013 and amity university in 2015 he was conferred the prestigious isc vikram sarabhai memorial award in 2012 bhaskar award again in 2009 harinath lifetime achievement award 2013 ashish misra lifetime achievement award 2020 and lifetime geospatia leadership award 2019 He published about two thousand two hundred papers in peer-reviewed journals. I hope I think all the all our participant must be waiting to to Dr. Naik. Thank you, sir. This is my introduction. Back to you, Sudhi. Many thanks. Many thanks to Mahapatra for introducing our. I esteemed to the audience uh, now it's my proud place to request uh, dr salis naik to please start his presentation his topic is advances in the earth system sciences and their societal benefits and at the same time i request all our distinguished delegates participants who are there if they want to ask any questions and any queries they can send to the chat box itself and that will be answered at the end of the presentation uh, dr naik please 
Thank you very much, Dr. Mohanty, Dr. Mahapatra, very distinguished participants and many of them very good friends of mine. It's really a pleasure to talk to you, such a distinguished audience. I must uh, first uh, say I'm grateful to Dr. Mohanty for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk about some of the benefits of the earth system science. As uh, you know, that uh, this topic uh, about the earth system science has come up about last 30 years or so. And uh, it takes care of uh, the all aspects of the earth. That means uh, the all geosphere, biosphere, cryosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. And uh, this uh, basic idea that this science is very important for the country, was of a, what we call as a national importance. And why is it so? So we had uh, set up the, what is we call as an agenda for this uh, earth system science. And there are three main uh, aspects. One, we look at the new perspective in the earth system, the whatever the questions or scientific questions which we need to answer, exploration, especially in new areas, especially the polar regions or the seabed. And the most important now in last three, four decades is how the interaction between the earth system processes and the anthropogenic processes interacting and influencing both of them or vis a vis. The second is we need to understand various interaction which is going within these processes at a different spatial and temporal scales. That means whatever happening between air and uh, ocean or the geosphere and ocean or cryosphere and atmosphere or some of the processes involves more than one system as well, like our monsoon process. The second is, what are the consequences of these interaction and how they are affecting the human systems? And this we need to address with a lot of new ideas and also many times a new technology. Now, these are the two things which normally scientists are engaged and uh, most of the work they do in this. The third aspect, which is very critical, is whatever knowledge we gain from our understanding or discovering of a new phenomena or perspective, how this can be used for the public good. And this aspect normally is not addressed. And that is why sometimes, you know, the scientists find themselves away from the society. So we have been trying that how best we can take the outcome of the scientific research to the use them for the societal benefit. And there were many such case studies. However, I will not show you all, but few examples how it has been done. Now, the two important aspects which we have been addressing uh, this century is one is the hazards. Other, of course, is the climate change. But these hazards we have been seeing, also some of them may be because of the impact, their intensity and magnitude might have increased because of the climate change. But this, the hazards, I think one of the most important things which we need to address. Now, since many of you are from Orissa, I thought, will I start with the cyclone? And you may all remember that 20 years back, uh, roughly 20 years back in 1999, when super cyclone hit Orissa, almost 10,000 people died. And uh, at that particular time, it was not that the understanding of cyclone was not there or the forecast was not given, but along with the information, also we need to prepare the social system, that means the governance, the response, the organization which responds to this kind of a warning, and the people, how conscious they are about the hazards. 
I remember that uh, in Orissa, I visited immediately after cyclone, and many people believed that such things will not happen. You know, the because the forecasts were not very accurate earlier. So people had no trust, and same way, the there was no specific organization to respond to such kind of an hazards. In 2004, the NDMA was formed, and there is now NDRF. And so there is an organization at the central, at the state, and many cases even at the district level to respond to such things. Now, this, the all the three together that we improved our uh, forecast, and that essentially happened because large amount of satellite data started becoming available. One, of course, from the geosynchronous satellites in set, which is providing every 15 minutes information, which gives you the information if the cyclone is forming or not, and their aerial extent, how they is moving, what is its intensity, and many other satellites are now being used, which is assimilated into a numerical weather prediction models. And now we have come that almost the landfall accuracy of about 40 meters. And you would know most of the that the eye itself may be around 30 um, kilometer or so. So achieving this accuracy is extremely good. And uh, last decade, you have seen that all the cyclones were informed much well in advance, and there was a response mechanism. The people were also having trust in the administration as well as in the forecast, and this has. Uh, able to save lives up to quite a bit. I mean, now you see that the most of the time the death is in some 10, 10, 20, 30 kind of thing. So this is a major uh, help or major achievement of how science and technology together to minimize the loss of lives. So almost from 10,000 to the 10 to 20. So this is something which is extremely important. And not only that, this information is not only provided to India, but the all countries in Bay of Bengal and Arabia, see that means all Bangladesh or Myanmar or this side, uh, the Middle East and all these countries are provided in time these advisories. So this I would consider one of the major uh, achievement and the benefit to the uh, society. And this is also, uh, since it is affect society, the prime ministers also have acknowledged and uh, the last uh, Orissa super cyclone, uh, there were a lot of uh, pressure on Orissa government from US that our forecast is not likely to be true. And the uh, prime minister was aware of it. We had persisted that our forecast will be accurate and it turned out to be that our work the very close uh, 220 kilometer the intensity of wind when us was predicting more than 300 kilometers so we had achieved the system the entire place where we could do even uh, and the uh, another cyclone came in the same year and uh, this uh, when the current prime minister was there philip cyclone and he articulated very well that how the technology was used. The, it was given almost seven days before, the velocity be same, the direction, time, and this helped to save the lives. So I think the appreciation at the highest level clearly shows that the, how the earth system science has helped to the society. The second major example is of a uh, tsunami, though the, it doesn't come as frequently as cyclone, but when it comes, it can do tremendous damage. And last time when it came, uh, 2004, we lost almost 20,000 people and entire in Indian Ocean, more than three lakh people died. So this is one which is, uh, very important to build a system, but there were a lot of challenges. The challenges is the time available, unlike cyclone, which is few days. Here it is a couple of hours at the most. 
So this is, we need a system which can respond within that system. And for that, the most of the tsunami, since it is generated by the earthquake, we depend on the seismic stations and the data and try to process them as fast as possible. When we started, the processing used to take more than an hour. And uh, there is no real-time seismology at that time in the country. So the first thing is we did is setting up of a system which can process the data in a real time. So all the seismic data, all the tide data, the sea level data are collected through variety of means, the satellite essentially, different satellites, and this information is processed into a control center where the another information is available on bathymetry and topography and all such things. And the models were made, it is used, and then the information uh, transferred to all concern. Now, since as I told you that the time is very short, what we tried to do is this entire process is completely automatic. There is no human intervention. Today we are talking about Internet of Things, but this was implemented in 2007 itself in India, first time for the tsunami warning system. That entire thing completely machine-based and the first information goes automatically. Now, another innovation which we did at that time, those who are familiar with the Pacific Tsunami Warning System and Japan uh, Meteorological Agency Tsunami Warning System, they were giving tsunami warning and a base advice. That means Bay of Bengal or Arabian Sea. And uh, if we have to give similar warning, it is impossible to evacuate people from the entire basin. So we devised a system which we call as a coastal forecast point. So we are now giving a forecast at 1,800 coastal forecast points all along the Indian Ocean margin. You can see some of the dots all along the coast. These are the, and the other challenge was that the, if you run the model, it used to take 90 minutes at that time. So you can't wait that long. So what we did is we run all possible scenarios of an earthquake at different places, different uh, magnitude, right from 6.5 onwards, and uh, made a simulated scenarios. We turned out to be 50,000 in, <coughs> in number and a huge database of a 15 terabytes. So even the complete decision support system around GIS was made where it can find the right scenario and provide this information to all concerned through web and email services. <clears throat> so this is, the India was the first to use the simulated model outputs and provided location-based forecast for the first time for the tsunami in 2007. Since then, this uh, last 14 years, the system has been working extremely well. And till today, there is not a single false warning. Now, this also was uh, very much appreciated at the highest level by the Prime Minister. He said that uh, the decision to set up the new Ministry of Earth Sciences following ocean tsunami. So he said that we have an ability to issue the alert within 13 minutes of a tsunami genetic event. Of course, now we have been able to do even better than that. We are giving about six to eight minutes the first information goes. And <clears throat> This also provides the leadership in the Indian Ocean because the information is provided to entire rim countries in the Ocean, which is also uh, recognized by the current Prime Minister. So this is the another example. And now the, some of the challenges are still there that the large earthquakes are not being uh, underestimated normally. This is what happened in Japan. Uh, in, they estimated about magnitude 7.9 instead of 9.1 and accordingly the tsunami uh, was predicted but it turned out to be quite serious and about 1000 people died even though 
all the system was in place. So there is a still a lot of scope to further improve upon it. And now we have been trying to use GP, GPS or GNRS data to estimate the magnitude and convert this magnitude into the uh, rupture into the magnitude and then give the tsunami warning. Also, the inversion of the tidal and sea level data is also in progress and real-time model because of now the computing power has increased. So we are also started with the real-time model. Of course, there are still challenges if the near field tsunamis, uh, there is uh, not sufficient time. Also, if tsunami is generated because of volcano or uh, landslides, there also the time may not be sufficient. So these are the challenges which we still has to address. The third major area, which is of the earthquake, I will not go into the details of the earthquake, but uh, the other, the triggered earthquakes is one thing which is uh, happening. And the first uh, known triggered earthquake is because of the Koina earthquake, where what happens is that the our anthropogenic various engineering activities can release the pre-existing stress of a tectonic origin. So this is what uh, happening in many places on the world is essentially because of the reservoir impounding or the deep surface or mining of a very large scale. And we have seen for shale gas extraction, the fracking uh, also is introducing some kind of a small earthquakes uh, in Pennsylvania, or 2.53 magnitude earthquakes. And of course, underground explosions could be nuclear or any can also uh, lead to a trigger earthquake. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, the problem of an earthquake, so what the advantage in this uh, Koina earthquake, we thought that we will investigate and uh, because they are occurring at a relatively shallow depth, maximum around up to seven kilometers. So a lot of uh, initial preliminary work done. And in 2017, a pilot borehole up to three kilometers were done. And a lot of information came. First time, the information about the entire Deccan Basar, the thickness, which is now put as 1,250 meters, comprising of 46 lava flows. This information came for the first time. And the Deccan traps are directly overlying in granite basement, at least in this part of the region. And this information also, the most people believe that there are Kalagi sediments between the granites and the Deccan basalt. But in this part, it is not there. Also, we found a lot of fault fractures uh, in this uh, borehole. And uh, we found that the entire area has, because of the repeated seismic activity has become big. And we don't expect that the large earthquake like what happened during 1967 will happen again. So this information has already been available. The, now the idea is to go right up to seven kilometers and observe what kind of physical changes are going on before earthquake, during earthquake, and after the earthquake. And there are certain changes are going, which if we can measure and model, then we may have a better handle on reservoir use specifically. So this is, the project is uh, still undergoing, and I'm sure that in coming years, we will have probably first time models for the reservoir induced seismicity. Now, the usefulness of this is that many areas when the dam or reservoir is constructed, in especially uh, area which are seismically active, we would know that whether this area would face this kind of a problem or not. So it would be quite useful to model this reservoir induced seismicity. The weather and climate, the, one of the most important aspect is uh, monsoon. Uh, and for India, because the our, about 17% of GDP depends on the agriculture output, and which is largely depends on the monsoon. Even if it is irrigated, the rain has to come from somewhere. So this is very important. And almost 50% of the people directly or indirectly depend on the agriculture related activity. So this is very critical. And uh, when we started, the skill of forecast was only about 0. 0.4. Uh, 
That means most of the time you will be wrong than right. So, and at that time, the limit was put at 0.65. That means beyond this, you cannot do a prediction or a, the skill cannot be further improved. So we had launched a major program, what we call as the Monsoon Mission. And we involved not only the National Institute, but also international, six universities from US, two from US, the UK, one each from Japan and Australia to work on the problems which we want. At the same time, we also set up a necessary infrastructure of computing. We set up a training school to train people <clears throat> and also brought all the three major uh, institutes of uh, metrology, NCMR, WF, IMD, and IITM together to develop this. Now, the, after the first phase is over, we have been now able to achieve the scale up to 0.71. So we have already breached the limit which was there and the phase two, we will be further able to improve. So this is the seasonal forecast. But at the same time, we have now given the extended range forecast that is for three weeks before and also the high resolution forecast, which is for next five to 10 days, which is all, also have been improved. And uh, today, the India is considered as the leading country as far as the monsoon research is concerned. And now WMO has recognized that and said that the major center of monsoon research will be India. So this is one uh, good thing, but there are many other issues still to be addressed and which is being now addressed into the phase two. Uh, the, some of the processes in the Bay of Bengal, because large amount of fresh water is getting mixed there and understanding that mixing process and then putting them into a model is one of the major issue, which is now we have understood that what kind of mixing takes place. Now the next is how we can put this information into the high resolution ocean model. And also now we have to develop the system which can be done in a couple model, which is atmosphere ocean model. So assimilation techniques are also to be developed for this coupling system. And some of the extreme weather events are to yet to be done. So this is currently uh, being done. <clears throat> and in this process, the originally the model we took from US, and this is what uh, the President Obama who came and that is the time when we agreed the U.S. agreed to part with their model. So, and why he agreed is very important. He said it is to empower farmers because he met uh, farmers and he was very happy to learn that we are providing free updates on market and weather conditions on their cell phones. So that was the reason he thought that we need to improve upon the monsoon and the U.S. and India work together. And today, <clears throat> based on the advisories which we are giving, which is being used by 40 million farmers. And what it gives is rainfall, maximum, minimum temperature, cloud, humidity, and wind, which is required for the uh, farmer to do various uh, practices, whether plowing or sowing or irrigation scheduling, fertilizer, pesticide applications, choosing crop variety. All this information is now based on the forecast which is given. <clears throat> and this forecast, of course, uh, it's given at district level, but uh, already block level forecast has been started. And the annual benefit which is coming out is done by National Council of Applied Economic Research is about 10,000 crores per year. So with this information has empowered farmer to increase their income and because we have found that about 7% increase in the productivity if they use this uh, weather forecast efficiently. Now, also we need to do that what is likely to happen in future. We all have experience that the light and moderate events have been decreasing and the heavy uh, events are increasing. And this is what the model also, uh, the climate earth system model also have been uh, developed by India now, and we participated in IPCC 6 
uh, where the Indian model is also used. <clears throat> and we now believe that this is going to happen. So our strategy for next 10, 20 years should be such that how we provide water to all increasing population. Now, there are, what we suggest based on this information is that the changes in this pattern, rainfall pattern, also the sea level is changing and the terrain, these three things has to be integrated now to understand how the shallow groundwater table is going to be affected. Now, this is very critical because the shallow groundwater table not only supports the, the terrestrial ecosystem and base flow, but also for crop, this is very critical. So, but we have not paid much attention to the shallow groundwater table. And I think we need to model and what is likely to happen in future. Now, there are some attempts made based on the satellite gravity. I think these are further needs to be updated and regular forecast or at least status of the shallow groundwater table should be made available so that we know that what is likely to happen to our crops and the terrestrial ecosystem. The other thing is we need also an accounting system. That means whatever is the requirement of the human as well as terrestrial ecosystem, both has to be put in together so that the some of the issues which are coming up that uh, while constructing dam, the downstream don't get water. I think this accounting system is uh, very much uh, critical. And the last point is, that the not only the rainfall, but the variability in snowfall also is very critical as far as the Indus Basin is concerned. And uh, because this entire water which comes in Indus Basin is essentially because of the snowfall and the ice melt. So this information also is required. And I think we need to build a very efficient system for snowfall uh, fall, uh, as we are doing for rainfall. And this work is also under progress as of now. Some of the <clears throat> ocean services which we have been done, like uh, crop, uh, the fishery is another major area which we need to address. And about 7 million uh, people are dependent on fisheries and related activities. So the satellite-based information on sea surface temperature and chlorophyll and the currents are being used to find out where the fish is likely to occur. Now, the basic idea in this is that the sea surface temperature will define the environment, whether it is suitable for fish or not. The second is the food, which is taken as a, from the chlorophyll, and the currents also uh, decide the movement of the fish pools. So all this three information is now being done, and it is very regularly used by the fishermen and what has happened because of this is that the search time has reduced by 70% and increase in catch by four, four times, two to four times. Now, this <clears throat> has increased their, uh, reduced their cost. And also, when the search time reduces, the less fuel is used. And apart from the cost of the fuel, that much less carbon dioxide is put into atmosphere. So it is also environmental friend. Some people argued that this, you are encouraging the overfishing, but it is not so. The total capture fishery is 3.8 million tons, while the potential is 5.1 million tons. And most of the stocks are fished within the biological sustainable limits. So <clears throat> this has uh, <clears throat> really helped uh, fishermen. And uh, the one estimate which is made by National Council of Applied Economic Research, that the additional income per trip is now 17,800 17, rupees. This is a normal facing vessel, which is about 20 meter or so. This income is, so practically the per trip is minimum couple of days they make one trip. So that income has substantially increased. Now the next stage, which is now being done is similarly like crop, uh, every year we give the forecast that what is likely production. 
Now, in the fishery, they used to give only for 10 years. But now we understand that the conditions, uh, the physical, chemical, biological processes are not exactly same uh, every year. So we should be able to provide a potential fishery forecast based on the uh, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, and then how the upwelling and how these things are changing. So this uh, annual is under uh, construction. This model is being developed. I'm sure that in coming few years, we would be also provide season-wise likely fish availability and accordingly the fishing activity can be planned. The another major area is to provide about the sea state. That means the waves, currents, mixed layer depth and sea surface temperature. And this is used by many, especially all the shipping industry, coast guards and many others. So even including fishermen. So this now we have a model by which we can give a global forecast, we can give regional forecast, coastal forecast for islands and location specific, the ports and harbors, all this is now possible to give. And this is continuously given for uh, next five days. Every six hourly forecast has been given. And this is being used by many ports and tremendous benefit has come uh, to the shipping, fishing, and also security agencies. The next area is the coast and what is called as a coastal marine spatial planning. Now this is a one a thing which is a science built tool for planning the coastal and marine area. And uh, in India, what we are doing, the spatial planning has come through a coastal regulation zone notification. It was originally 91, it was revised in 2011 and 19, as we started understanding this more. And this now, India is one of the very few countries in the world where the spatial coastal zone management maps are available for all the states. And all the developmental planning is based on this coastal zone management plans. And uh, this, it includes uh, Many things, the, the status of the coastal habitat, mangrove, coral reefs, what are the shoreline changes, what is the vulnerability, all this. I will show you some examples of this. So this is the kind of uh, basic map, uh, which is essentially produced from the satellite image. And uh, it delineates the high water line, low water line. Also, some of the important land use and wetland geomorphic categories. And this is done by National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management in Chennai under Ministry of Environment and Forest. And this is provides all information to everyone. Similarly, the shoreline change maps for the long term as well as the short term is now being provided by National Center for Coastal Research for the entire country on a routine basis. And this is also very important to understand the impact of the engineering activities as well as the impact of the sea level and to understand normal building processes, especially on the East Coast. This is very useful to understand how Delta is progressing and the impact of the anthropogenic activity as well as possible rise of the sea level. <clears throat> And the vulnerability maps uh, also produced using information on the coastal topography, using the stereo images, as well as the LIDAR, aerial LIDAR survey. And uh, this over these maps, the cadastre maps are also superimposed. So we know that which are the areas and how vulnerable they are. So this kind of maps are also available for the country. And the very recently, the new concept has been started where we are started identifying blue flag beaches. So this is a certification process given by international agency based on the UGRO. It is called the Federation of Environmental Education. And they give certification based on the how beach is safe or not, what is the water quality, 
whether the other facilities for the uh, swim, bathing and swimming, the toilets, uh, shower room, other medical kits, all those things are available. So now the eight beaches in India, uh, Shivrajpur in Gujarat, Gogla in Deep, Kasargod, Padubar in Karnataka, Kappad in Kerala, Rishikonda in Epi, and Golden Beach in Puri in Orissa and Radhanagar. These are declared as a blue flag beaches. And this certification has to be done every year. So there is a continuous monitoring of water quality and all these uh, parameters is undertaken. And another 10 beaches, which is now likely to be approved in September. So we will have about 18 beaches. And the plan is that in the next couple of years, we should have about 100 beaches, which will be designated as a blue flag. Now, this will not ensure the safety and all, but also attract a high-end tourism in this area. <clears throat> the third is uh, mineral resources and the technologies. We all know that uh, the minerals are a major source of the industrial development. And we are all dependent on the minerals from the land as of now. But in future, we will have to depend for the minerals also from on the ocean as we are depend, depending for petroleum on the ocean. So the large amount of survey, about 31,000 line kilometers has been done, all seismic, gravity, magnetic, including the ocean bottom seismometers, bathymetry, and the entire data sets of the huge data sets. Now this information is used to extend our uh, uh, I mean, to claim the continental shelf area as a part of our uh, sovereign control over that. And this uh, we have given for the 0.6 uh, million square kilometer in the Arabian Sea have been already identified. Uh, and another 0.6 in the Bay of Bengal will be identified soon. Now this will add 1.2 uh, square million, uh, million square kilometer. So our land area is 3.2, our EZ is 2, and another 1.2. So the seabed will become uh, access to seabed 3.2 million square kilometer, which is almost equivalent to land. So we have a huge opportunity to explore this region for finding the minerals and many other things for the future. So this is one which is currently undergoing. At the same time, <clears throat> the, some of the placers which you are quite familiar. <coughs> it's a huge resource of uh, placers in our Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra, Orissa, Maharashtra coast, uh, also on the coast as well as the near so regions. And uh, this is total is almost about 380 million tons of a different kinds of minerals. And the ilmenite especially is a very high, about 22%. Now here, the certain things has not happened is that though the Ministry of Mines have identified five minutes by five minutes, I think the further exploration is not happening because of various reasons, the issues between Ministry of Mines and the state government, the contracts between the private explorer and so this has not been realized, but the total value as of now could be 150 billion. So we are ready with all the techniques, mining, beneficiation, but this resource is yet to be harvested. Similarly, on a deep sea, for a long time, we have been exploring the polymetallic nodules in the central Indian Ocean. And uh, poly uh, we have now identified a site 12.5 kilometer by 12.5 kilometer as the first uh, mining site. The beneficiation and all has been done and uh, almost 95% of the uh, metal could be recovered. And total value is put at 187 billion. So this is a huge resource, but uh, to mine them, you need a technology. So I will come back to that slightly later. The second is the polymetallic sulfides, which is associated with hydrothermal vents, is also very important. And uh, along with copper, lead, zinc, 
you also have a gold silver and many other metals so this is exploration has been started in 10000 square kilometer and soon we would uh, have the some of the vents have been already identified but there is further work is yet to be done <clears throat> second the last is the cobalt is becoming very critical mineral now and we don't have a resources on land so the ferro magnesium uh, ferro manganese crust where the cobalt percentage is pretty high uh, as high as 0.9% uh, has been found now the exploration rights for this are being now taken and then we will be further exploring this now the important thing that these all are available beyond 3000 meter 4000 5000 6000 meter depth so the technology which you need is also quite different the first thing you need is a, what we call as a soil tester you need to uh, test the strength of the seabed what kind of uh, equipment it can handle so this soil tester has been developed and it is uh, tested up to 6000 meter it is working very well it provides all properties of soil and this is working pretty well the second is the remotely operable vehicle which is on the right side which is something like a satellite which can hold the payload of 150 kg so you can put any sensors uh, which you want to measure for oxygen or a temperature or a chlorophyll or whatever you want to measure you can put a uh, sensor it will give and also is the robotic arms to collect the sample these also have been tested up to 6000 meter and working the next thing is the mining equipment what we call as a crawler for the manganese it will collect the nodules from the sea surface and crush it and make a slurry and push it upwards to the ship so this has been tested up to 1100 meter the this season i think it will be tested up to 6000 so in a couple of years i think we would be ready but this is not enough actual mining you need to do many more things because then this kind of a technology has to be transferred to industries and also the techno commercial aspects environmental aspects so many things are to be done but we are getting ready with the technology so because we believe that in next 30 years we will have to mine these minerals from the ocean seabed and uh, for our requirement the other major requirement in many coastal areas is the water and uh, many areas now uh, do not have water like Luxpeep Island do not have any source of water and normally the RO uh, technology was used to it is highly energy intensive and second is also the release the wastewater release can completely destroy the ecology of the surrounding so the new technology low temperature thermal desalination has been now evolved and uh, which is very simple technology as such science is very simple the surface water is brought to a chamber where it will further evaporate and the evaporates are taken into the next chamber and uh, there it is cooled by bringing water from the depth of 800 meter and you get a fresh water. So science is very simple but the engineering is quite complex and this has been done in three islands of uh, Luxwe which is working for last 15 years without any problem and uh, the major advantage uh, of this is that the health related issues of Lux Trip Islanders is, has been resolved up to 90% and uh, the cost of per liter is only 62 pesa. We always buy 10, 15 rupees bottle a liter. So this is quite cheap. And the challenge is now how to scale it up. These are very small plants, 100 and 100,000, 150,000, which is sufficient for the population of uh, five to 7,000 on each island for the drinking water needs. So if we have to supply a metro like uh, Vishakapatnam or uh, Chennai, we need almost 10 million liters per day. So this plan, this plan is already been made and the cost will come out about one rupee per liter but the engineering part is a major challenge and that is being addressed now. 
the energy resource also is now we are going to depend on the gas hydrate. Uh, we have huge resource of uh, gas hydrate. There are possibility of the offshore wind, wave currents. These are at a different stages of a development. I will quickly go through them. The large reserves of uh, gas hydrate have been found in uh, East Coast on the Godavari Maha as well as uh, on the Andaman Nicobar Islands. The main thing is how do we develop the exploiting technology? Because these are a solid gas, solidified under pressure. This is a methane gas solidified under pressure. So we have to mine also with the same pressure. So we need to build pressurized mining equipment. And that is where the challenge is. And now I think uh, this is being addressed. The next uh, is uh, some of the, on the polar science, which is a very long shot, uh, not only for the uh, resource, but also for the environment and especially for the water, the glaciers and the snow are very critical. And we know that these glaciers are retreating, uh, which is, but in the Western, they are retreating slowly, while in the Central and Eastern, they are retreating much faster ways. So this is, of course, we know that the Western is mainly dependent on the Western disturbances, not on the monsoon. Well, Central and these are dependent, but we need to understand much more that why, there are differential rates of the uh, retreat. The second thing which I told briefly, these estimates of the snow, this is very critical because what is the change in the snow? In Bhutan, it was found that it is decreasing at the rate of 3%, but we do not have data on the other part, especially in the Indus Basin, whether the snowfall is increasing or decreasing. So this would have a very long-term impact on the water availability in entire Northwest uh, India, as well as on the Pakistan, because most of the food production is happening in Northwest India. And this is dependent on the snow and the ice melt. So this understanding is necessary. And I, I'm sure that in coming years, this will come. The second area which is we need to address is the Arctic. And, uh, not only because the, our uh, monsoon also depends on what happens in the Arctic, but also there are various resources. So we need to have a presence in Arctic. Now India has a lab, uh, sent, uh, station in Arctic in Long Year B, and we also have set up some of the ocean observing systems to understand how the interaction between the fjord and ocean is taking place around the year. So this data is now being analyzed to understand. Of course, we need to collect data for a longer period, at least for 10, 15 years to understand the climate processes. So this has started in last seven years. So, but wealth of information has come from this information. Now, many have been arguing that why we should be in Arctic. Now, the one thing which is very clear is that what happens in North Atlantic and Arctic has been established. In Holocene, we have seen that the monsoon weakens when the cold episodes in Atlantic and the Arctic. So this is the one reason. Also, the whatever happens in Northwest Himalaya, the heavy rainfall events, also we have found that the Canadian Arctic, there is a further melt in the Canadian Arctic. So, and if that melting occurs, again, it will create a separate kind of a system in the Arctic. So, both the Himalayas and Arctics are interacting, and we need to understand. So, that is the first thing. And since we have only one station currently in uh, Norway, the second station in Canada is uh, being set up. But we also need uh, stations in uh, Greenland and Alaska. So, this is a major requirement. We also need to set up the satellite receiving station so that we can capture from Hyderabad, we capture only three to four orbits. We need to capture 10 to 11 orbits for real time information. So this is the another thing. Also the access to critical metals and rare earth, uh, especially in Greenland, uh, this 
we also need for our requirement of future. So we need to also do our shipping routes uh, in the Arctic, also the seabed survey. The, so there are n number of uh, opportunities. So India has to be have a presence in Arctic. We have now a station, but we need to increase our activities in the Arctic. <clears throat> and the, similarly in Antarctica also, currently, of course, the, our interest is mostly a scientific. We want to understand how the weather, climate, and paleoclimate is affecting us, what happened in the Antarctica. Also, one of the major challenge of the breakup of Gondwana, plate tectonics, and how India actually moved so fast, uh, about 18 to 20 centimeter per year, compared to currently the maximum speed of the plate is around eight centimeter. So why India moved so fast right from Southern hemisphere to the Northern hemisphere? This is a challenging problem which yet to be understood. The second is a lot of biodiversity. The lot of uh, they uh, survive in very harsh conditions. So they have certain bioactivity which we need to harness. Now, currently, of course, under the Arctic Treaty, the, we do only scientific, but there could be a possibility after 2040 of, and if, as and when ice melts, there could be a possibility. So all countries are trying to set up their stations and some kind of indirect way of saying that we, our presence is there. So India need to maintain presence uh, in Antarctica. Uh, we have already have a two stations, but I think we need to further upgrade our presence in Antarctica for the future. So this work, of course, uh, done by many institutes and I would great, like to acknowledge the efforts done by several institutes of Ministry of Earth Science as well as uh, CSIR for the input uh, for this talk. With this few remarks, I thank for the opportunity which is given to me. And I'm sorry I took five minutes a little bit more than what I promised to Dr. Bharti, but uh, I think it may be all right uh, in this, and I would be very happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. The presentation was simply brilliant. You have already dealt with all the entire gamut of aspects relating to the advances in the art system sciences and their societal benefits. Already there are so many questions in the chat box. So now I would request our senior executive council member of the society, Dr. B. So kindly take up the question and answer sessions and Dr. please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sujit Mahanthi. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Yes, Shadesh yes, Thank you, Dr. Shadesh Naik, for a wonderful presentation. I just cannot, uh, I mean, list out the item, topics which you have touched in your, in the, in your presentation. Such a wide range of spectrum of scientific data which you have touched. It is, I mean, we, instead of five minutes extra time which you have taken, we would have loved you to have taken another 50 minutes preferably, and we would have continued to listen to you. It was in enticing your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will come back to um, uh, pick up some questions from the chat box. Is It may not be possible to, uh, I apologize in the beginning that uh, we may not be able to accommodate all the questions, but then yes, we will try to accommodate as much as possible. So let me begin with uh, uh, Dr. L. Man Singh. His question is, so far, how many tsunamis have been detected by the warning system? Actually, there are several small tsunamis uh, did come. Actually, as soon as we inaugurated the, this center, the small tsunami at Chennai, 20 centimeter also came. And uh, there were some seven, eight small, small tsunamis which have come. But the importance is uh, for tsunami warning center, 
is not only to detect tsunami. See, what is happening after 2004, as soon as the earthquake occurs in Indonesia, there is a, some kind of panic comes, especially in Tamil Nadu and other coast. And to tell them that tsunami is not going to come is also equally important. So many times people have argued that tsunami may come once in a year, why you are spending so much money. But the most important thing is that tsunami is not going to come also is equally important for us. So, and there are several cases where we have told that the tsunami is not going to happen. Even when uh, uh, Japan thing came, parliament session was on and the request came from the minister that uh, many members wants to know whether we will be affected or not. So we could immediately tell, yes, there was nothing we have to worry where it is going. So many times what happens is that the information of happening or not happening, both are very critical. Like in cyclone also, where cyclone is likely to go, whether it is going to hit uh, Balasore or it is going to hit Vishakapatnam is also equally important. And if we tell that it is not going to hit Calcutta, it is also very important information as far as West Bengal is concerned. So this kind of thing is, we have to see frame in this context. Thank you, Dr. Nayak. Now I will go to next question is from our president, Dr. Okanath Mahanti. His question is compared to the accuracy from cyclone prediction model, probably because of the high degree of freedom in cloud formation systems. How does India go forward in improving our accuracy of monsoon prediction? Yeah, monsoon uh, prediction is, uh, you know, the Internationally, the skill limit was set at 0.65. We had a long discussion with all international experts. But the kind of work which we had done, our understanding of the various processes have improved and continue to improve, especially with Bay of Bengal thing. Uh, we have yet to further uh, integrate it to our models, whatever knowledge has been. Because once you have the understanding, then to observe those parameters, include into uh, assimilate this information into models is also a process. So I think another uh, five years or so, we would be able to take uh, the seasonal forecast 0 0.7 to 0 0.75 yeah. to 8 uh, at that skill, which is quite good enough. Uh, once you have about 0.8 skill, uh, that means most of the time your predictions will be pretty good. But the challenge would be then not only the all India forecast, but the regional forecast. Because we have seen that even if the all India forecast is accurate, the regional forecast is not that accurate. So we need to further uh, build up our understanding of the regional forecast. And there, again, the processes which are likely to affect such thing has to be done. So this is sort of a, I would say, continuous process for understanding, improving our understanding about various processes, parameterize them, this into include into model, and then further improve the forecast. So I think this will continue for some more time. But uh, I can say with a lot of confidence that at least the short-term forecast, we have extremely good uh, accuracy now. And uh, that is why large number of farmers are using it, which actually matters. The seasonal forecast requirement is at the national level for the planning of uh, seeds and fertilizers and those kind of things. Individual farmer is not much affected by the uh, seasonal forecast. They are affected by the onset, which is pretty good, and the short-term forecast. And the state governments need to have a forecast of uh, three weeks, which is also now reasonably good. So overall monsoon forecast in this three, I would say that we are doing pretty well. Only the seasonal forecast at the regional scale, we need to do more work. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have next question from Dr. S.K. Vadavan, our ex-DG from GSI. 
are we increasing the density of rain gauge stations throughout India for better understanding of rainfall variability <clears throat> and its application for working out realistic thresholds for predicting terrain specific landslides vulnerability? Yeah, the, see the problem is uh, twofold. One is if we, even if we can increase the rain gauges, uh, technically there is no issue. But the problem is that as you increase the number of rain gauges, calibrating them also is issue. And if you want to include this data into the models, uh, you need calibrated data sets. So currently, the calibrated data sets available about 1500 data sets which is quite sufficient. The other thing what we have been doing is assimilating large amount of satellite data, which is also provides the rainfall. So now about 48 satellite data is assimilated every six years, uh, which totally about 400 GB data is assimilated routinely. So which also improves the information which is locally uh, available. So initial conditions are now pretty good, uh, which we have been able to get uh, along with the in-situ measurements as well as the satellite measurements. Now, as far as the landslides are concerned, I think we can definitely have a more uh, rain gauges locally, and they did not have to be really calibrated uh, for assimilation into the models. But we need to work out a threshold for different regions that what kind of a rainfall or what kind of a rainfall intensity is likely to induce the landslides. Once we can understand that, and if we have the input on the soil moisture, which is also now available, not at the level which we need, but at a cross level from the satellite above the soil moisture, uh, this both the information about satellite and the ground information on the soil moisture, if we can integrate, I think we will have a major handle on landslide prediction. But at the same time, we also have to remember that landslide can also occur during earthquake. So that part will still remain unsolved under, unless and until we have a vulnerability maps. Now, there are so many vulnerability maps, landslide vulnerability maps are available, including GSI, ISRO, and the Wadi Institute, and you name the number, the landslide vulnerability maps are available. But uh, I could not find where the validation of these maps are done. So what is happening is that we are not able to identify which are really vulnerable and use certain observing system in these vulnerable areas. Unless we put observing systems in the vulnerable areas, we will not going to handle the earthquake. Any hazard if you take, we have the observation. Why we are able to do cyclone? Because we have observation. Why we are able to do extreme rainfall? Because we have observation. So for landslide, apart from the uh, rainfall, we also need measurement of a small changes which are occurring. And that can be also done by using the SAR interferometry, where we can see the small movement which is occurring, which normally happens even before the uh, areas. But you can't do this everywhere. So we need to have a plan that in vulnerable areas, we increase our observation. There are other radars also which can uh, we can put it to observe the changes which are occurring, but we can't put everywhere. So if we can identify vulnerable areas and make these observations, I think uh, the landslide predictions will become very simple. And I agree that we need to address this issue because actually there are more people are dying through landslide than the cyclone. But because the individual landslides are small and less number of people die. So the attention is not there like what happens in a cyclone or an earthquake. Or so our attention is also relatively less for the landslides. Thank you, Dr. Nag. Our next question is from Dr. Jayant Rautrai. Dr. Rautrai, your question is too big, so I'm going to focus only on the question, not the background which you have mentioned. The question is, 
It is important to note that India is following sim simulation models by coastal focus points. What is the degree of accuracy and reliability as compared to Japanese early warning forecasting system pertains to tsunami? Yeah, our actually, uh, our uh, system is much better than any system in the world today, including Japan or, because nobody gives uh, precise every 50 kilometer forecast. We are only giving this forecast and over a period of time, uh, there are uh, incident when uh, we had a two earthquakes happened in Bay of Bengal. And both the time, Japan and Pacific gave warning that Bay of Bengal will have a tsunami. And we said the tsunami is not going to happen in that. Of course, later on, they had withdrawn their uh, advisors. So I would say that the accuracy of our system is much better than any other system in the world. And in the terms of uh, uh, numbers, uh, the like Chennai, some of the where we have actually measured uh, if you can send me your email, I will send my paper also on the performance. Uh, 20 centimeter we had predicted and it turned out to be 18 meter. And the time difference was about three minutes. So it is pretty good uh, uh, accurate system which we have. And uh, if, you, if you can access uh, the Encyclopedia of Geophysics where the Tsunami Warning Center's uh, system is example of the Indian tsunami warning system is there. And there the performance and all other is given. But very precise information I can give, if you just send me an email, I will mail you this information. Thank you, Dr. Naik. Uh, Dr. Naik, I have to apologize for one reason. I'm not reading out the compliments that is coming with all the questions to you. So I'm just <laughs> filtering uh, out. Uh, I, I think I will pass it on to you later on in the in the yeah. in the copied form. So now next question is Dr. Manik Kalubarme. Again, I will summarize his question to this. His question is that in Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, uh, there is an increased number of uh, cyclones. Please discuss major reasons for increased cyclonic activity. It's too big a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, see the. A uh, number of cyclone per se is not increasing. But what is happening that the intensity of the cyclone has increased in the sense that earlier when the depression uh, used to form, the chances of converting into cyclones were much less. Now what we are seeing is that the intensity, most of the time, the cyclone coming with a large intensity, I mean, Last year, if you see the Philly, Woodwood, all were very major cyclones, not the smaller one. Now, the reason for this is what is happening is that the as the warming happening in the atmosphere, the most of the heat is being absorbed by the ocean. Almost 90% of the heat is absorbed by the ocean. And the ocean is heated up, not on the surface, but right up to 2,000. Oh, uh, 2,000 meter depth, and this increase that means there is an additional amount of uh, energy which is stored in, and this has to be dissipated. So the cyclone is the mechanism by which oceans tries to dissipate that heat into form of this. So that is why, because of the increased warming, because the normally if temperature goes above 27 degree in ocean, the possibility of cyclone increases. And such incidents are increasing day by day. It's the second reason in Bay of Bengal, the, there is a lot of influx of a fresh water. And the fresh water absorbs more heat compared to the saline water. So since there is a large amount of uh, fresh water, the Bay of Bengal generates more cyclone than the Arabian Sea. So this is the combination of this reason. I mean, this is the simplest way I could uh, explain. Of course, the entire exchange of process is very complex. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Nayak. Uh, our next question, I think we will have to be very, very, you know, selective here. We may not be able to uh, collect, uh, connect all the questions. Now, next is uh, Mr. A.B. Panigrahi, our secretary from of SGAT. His question is, he wants to know, 
the prospects of uh, uh, ex generation of uh, energy from wind on the east coast of india what are the prospects yeah actually there is a map you can uh, see on the inquis website also the major uh, is the tamil nadu coast as of now and the gujarat coast these are the two main areas where the possibility is maximum because you have to see that the wind of certain level available around the year so that is what uh, offshore uh, this is what is now being these two areas are mainly going to be considered in the initial phases okay and one question from dr subrangshu rai uh, retired geologist from gsi has the impact of deep sea mining on marine biota been properly assessed yeah it is it is being because that is the first thing which we will <coughs> to do and uh, there is entire book on the environmental assessment of the deep sea mining the there are different uh, scenarios are generated like uh, in case of a say manganese nodules uh, what is likely to happen it may generate a turbidity what will happen to the biota uh, and uh, and the to our surprise uh, at that depth also there are mega fauna uh, earlier we used to believe that there will be only microbes may be surviving but there are mega fauna also so this assessment is being made and it could be like any other uh, mining on the land uh, the international seabed authority will ask uh, for the very detailed assessment of the environment so while we are exploring this the current conditions of the environment and what is the status of the ecology is parallelly being done so before mining i think we will have to provide all the likely scenarios uh, that what is likely to happen and definitely when you mine uh, things will be affected there is no doubt about it but how much it will be affected what likely uh, time it will take for the or whether there is any resilience in the system once you stop mining whether the biota will come back or not all these analysis and simulations are being done there is another question from rajesh uh, i don't know rajesh um, full name is not there there was a project his question is there was a project kalpasar project launched to store 10000 million cubic meters of fresh water equating to 25% of gujarat's average annual rainwater flow from the rivers like narmada mahoi etc what is the progress of this project why not we think about such projects in the bay of bengal uh in bay of bengal i don't think it is uh, feasible as of now but in kalpsar uh, this uh, already planned i think they are agreed to construct a dam and a fresh water lake to be created which may take 5 7 years to become a fresh water because originally this brackish water has to progressively so but uh, in bay of bengal i don't think uh, it is going to be feasible uh, and there is no need also because the water availability is much better because of the large river systems the fresh water availability is quite good and the like in chennai and all where there is a issue in southern area i think the doing offshore desalination plant may be much easier to do and a simple compared to constructing any dam or blocking some area uh, and to do that that's what my feeling is thank you there is an observation by mr kuntia he says that there are huge reserves of deposits of heavy minerals on kerala and odisha coast and of course there are also on andhra pradesh coast and he feels that uh, the odisha sand complex and iru what that the working on them need expansion that is a, a, a statement observation i think there is no no yeah, question i think i agree and i think the sooner the better if the ministry of mines and anthropic mineral division <laughs> sort out all the issues 
uh, which is the atomic mineral, which is not, what is to be done, what is not to be done. I think uh, that is where I think the whole thing is in some kind of a, uh, loop. And I think we need to come out of that if we need to harvest uh, this resource. I think uh, we will have to call it a day because uh, there is no end to going on with this like this. You know, we have already exceeded, taken 27 minutes extra of uh, what we had promised to Dr. Naik. So I think we will come to the end of this uh, questions. And But only thing, I will wrap it up with one observation. Uh, you know, recently uh, we had a you know, on 11th of August, there was huge uh, tremor in the in the media about uh, uh, NASA giving statement that uh, the vulnerable coastal tract of India and coastal belt of India, which is going to be submerged in the coming till 2050. I I was really <laughs> shocked shocked in the sense in 2006. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, the name of the scientist I may be. Uh, making mixing up, uh, Dr. A. S. Rajawat from Space Application Center had given a presentation in Geological Survey for India CGPB meeting, where he had given a map for the entire 77,200 uh, kilometer coast of India, where we have vulnerable areas which was likely to be inundated by the sea level rise in future, and this was quantified. The area that <clears throat> extend the level above the present sea level, all those things were mentioned in the in that uh, presentation, and he had uh, given a map. I I tried to locate it, but I just couldn't get it. I would have shown it to you that this he did it in 2006, and today when NASA comes up with the same kind of information, there's a big tremor in the media. I think this is there. There is also some, you know somewhere. We have to bring it to the knowledge of the people so that people come to, I, I spoke to the TV people who had actually asked me this question. I had told them that this was known to us in 2006. And maybe it was uh, known earlier. We came to know in GSI in 2006. Thank you, Dr. So Dr. Naik. I don't think we can thank you enough for not only covering such a wide range of topics I mean, I mean, anything <laughs> under the sky That's has correct. been covered. Yeah. So I will try to read out only one um, comment from, from I don't know, his name is not there. Excellent presentation, the marine biodiversity. I think it's an excellent, excellent presentation. Dr. Yeah. Farooq, it is will... me, it is me, Dr. Farooq, it is me. Okay. okay, you can, you can speak yourself, please. <laughs> Oh, what I, it was a brilliant presentation. I wanted to know any activity done in the marine system. Dr. Then there will be much more stress on the biodiversity, marine biodiversity, which is already under stress. Yeah. What suggestions are the people can give? Yeah, actually, for the, I couldn't cover everything. But uh, we have a major program uh, called uh, Census of. Marine, Marine Census. Uh, see, we have divided the entire. Uh, there is a lot of eco. I, th I think I'm I would sorry. request people to I'm switch off there. Yeah. I would request people to mute their systems. Please. Please mute your systems. Somebody some of you oh, are working, some of you are speaking on your phones while you are not. Yeah. <laughs> May I yeah. request them to mute, so, please? So yes. we have a yes, major uh, program, what we call as a census of marine life. And the entire Indian Ocean is divided into three degree by three degree grids. And everything is measured, microbes to whales in this. And uh, there are already more than 200,000 uh, records and it is being collected uh, very detailed. And this is all been organized into Ocean Biogeographical Information System, OBIS, which is an international program. The Indian program is handled by Center for uh, Marine Living Resources in Kochi. And uh, this all data is available. And the lot of new species and lot of information, actually, 
the one whole lecture can be given on the census of marine life. And a lot of work uh, has been done. We have, and the all other countries also providing uh, the information on the marine biodiversity to uh, this data center. So large amount of information is uh, being collected, but it's a Herculean task. And uh, this is to be repeated like a census we do of every 10 years. Uh, we also have a plan to replicate every 10 years so that we can understand the changes which are already going on in the uh, biodiversity can be recorded. And uh, some of those things like uh, major fisheries species, uh, we have been working, especially sardine and mackerel. Uh, those uh, who know that earlier it used to be available only on a Kerala and Karnataka coast till 85. After 85, uh, there are a lot of, uh, in Kerala, people are complaining that there is not much uh, fisheries available. But this sardine and mackerel have shifted right up to the Maharashtra. Last year, Maharashtra has a record catch of a sardine and mackerel. Also in the East Coast, now Tamil Nadu and Andhra are reporting a sardine and mackerel. So changes are going on. Because of the ocean warming, there are changes occurring in the way the upwelling and the suitability of this uh, species for their environment. So we have been seeing this and many more species also may be happening. Actually, the other thing which is happening is on Kerala coast, the occurrence of jellyfish has increased. And jellyfish also depends on the phytoplankton like uh, sardine and mackerel. So the, there is a competition for the food also. So if jellyfish increases, sardine and mackerel also will uh, decrease. But some says that the warming increases, the jellyfish also increases because they have more resilient in a warmer water. So uh, there are so many observations which are happening and uh, we have fairly good idea, but I agree, we need to do this census every 10 years, uh, like what we do for the population on the land. I think then only we would be able to understand the complexities which is uh, undergoing. Uh, thank you so much. I think we will yes, now come to the end. Come to the question. Hello, Dr. Nayak. I yes. wanted to know why you had that logo of Chitti, the the. Uh, who is speaking, uh, please? The um, please. Uh, uh, no, I know who is speaking, please. The Garuda, Garuda Chitti on your all yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah. This is the logo of a Nyas. Is uh, taken from <laughs> Salvasatra. And uh, it is, uh, you know that it's a Vedi. Uh, yes. It is uh, when those who want to go to uh, heaven, uh, the, the all Vedis have to be done by constructing this uh, Vedi. And uh, this is actually uh, sixth century, but it has a lot of uh, science in it, actually. Uh, no, the, actually it, the, is, it is uh, earlier than sixth century, and it is from Vedas. Yeah, three... Vida, but the Salva Sutra came uh, in the 6th century, uh, roughly around that time. Uh, that is Manasara. <laughs> Manasara Sutra. Okay, and... so we, I think we, uh, uh, Mr. Farooq, uh, who is Mr. Uh, uh, who is taking over from here? Or we, yeah, I think Mr. Yeah, Abhi Padigrahi. Yeah, I, I, like to... I just like... want to thank you before you say, uh, and I go, I brought the ATS-6 to India. I set up the National Remote Sensing Agency, great, great, Bhaskara great. and the subsequent satellites. Thank you, thank Dr. you so Nayak, much, Mr. Sarma. It is Salma. a pleasure to hear you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Sarma. I would, I would fusely thank Dr. Farooq for very nicely moderating the question and answer session. Yes. And, uh, and this uh, enthusiasm, of this uh, distinguished participants is going high, but anyway, we are constrained to end somewhere. Now, now I would request our General Secretary, Mr. A.B. Panigrahi, <laughs> to propose a formal vote of thanks. Mr. Panigrahi, please. Uh, before Mr. Panigrahi speaks, I just want to say we cannot thank you enough, Professor uh, <laughs> Narek. But yes, that is a great you certainly I think we'll all clap, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Panigrai. Thank, Thank you very much. You have to unmute yourself, Mr. Panigrai. Mr. Panigrai, please, you have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, Professor Naik, uh, our speaker, uh, our president, uh, Dr. Omkarnath Mahanti. There are a number of senior professors I see on the screen, many of whom uh, I may not be uh, studying when uh, they might have retired also long back, and a number of seniors uh, and my colleagues from SGT and friends. Uh, it was indeed a, a privilege to have uh, Dr. Silas Naik, uh, a great uh, scientist, and uh, and he, he we, are, we are privileged to have him as our speaker uh, for the distinguished lecture series, uh, uh, lecture number four. Uh, his insight to, to the lecture was full of wisdom and information, and we have been uh, enlightened by his enlightening lecture. And uh, uh, may I, on behalf of uh, myself as well as on behalf of all the speakers. Uh, uh, really propose a uh, excellent vote of thanks to uh, Professor uh, Nayak uh, for the wonderful presentation. As well, please join us in uh, clapping. As well as, well as the uh, question and answer. The, actually, the question and answer were uh, really wonderful. So I request all of them, all of you, to please give a big hand from your own uh, places. Claps, right. And uh, as usual, our president is uh, highly energetic as well as knowledgeable. And he has been following us every day for uh, success of this uh, uh, small program, though it is a small program, but it is an eventful program. So my uh, heartfelt thanks to you, sir, uh, for your uh, constant monitoring uh, of, the, of the progress of this uh, event. Then my uh, uh, sincere, uh, most sincere thanks to uh, all the seniors, the participants uh, from India and abroad. There are, there are a few persons from abroad also. Professor Mansing, I know one of them, and uh, I think uh, Mansing is here. Yeah, yeah. I think Professor Sir, some uh, Professor Sarma or somebody was also there. He said he's right now in the United States. So, and all the uh, participants for uh, sparing their precious time to attend this uh, uh, really uh, excellent presentation from uh, mm -hmm. Professor Nike. I am uh, uh, really my most sincere thanks are due to our uh, colleagues, Sri uh, G.S. Puntia, Sri. Uh, Geza Prasad Mahapatra, uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. B. M. Haruk, and uh, Sri Sujit Mahanti, and Dr. Raj Gopal Mahanti, who has been doing all this uh, IT uh, part. And we are, for the first time, managing everything on our own. We have not taken help of any professional help. So we have <laughs> our own. I really, I am thankful to each one of you and the uh, distinct lecture series group who has been doing all the constantly monitoring how it is to be done in a uh, near perfect manner. And my uh, uh, thanks to all our uh, all our um, colleagues from SJT who have also participated, the EC members, the advisors, and everybody. Uh, they have been really, it, is a, it has been really a wonderful uh, lecture uh, to hear from Professor Nayak. And uh, I will, uh, I will uh, uh, last, uh, I will take the uh, permission of the president to uh, close this uh, lecture and with uh, to, before we say goodbye uh, we meet one second in uh, dls number 5 uh, that is due some <laughs> two, two months back two months uh, ahead so with this with the, with the permis, kind permission of the president we take this uh, lecture session as closed thank you very much before before we before we actually close thank i you. want to thank everyone i can see a number of friends here i can't actually name everybody i am very pleased to see professor lm patnaik from IIC Bangalore, from I, Professor UC Mahanti, and a large number of uh, friends, all of you, I request that uh, please join the SGAT um, movement, shall we call it. And of course, Professor Nayak, we met the other day before even this lecture. So you are one, one amongst us now, and we'll, I hope that we will continue to give your, uh, receive your support. Thanks very much. Good night, everyone. It was a pleasure meeting Professor uh, Mahanti after a long time, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Director, <laughs> Professor Sales Naik, sir. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. He's your neighbor. <laughs> yes. He's your neighbor okay. in Bangalore. Yes. Yeah. He's my boss. Yeah. <laughs> I work in his lab. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> I work in Nias. Okay. Oh, you are working in Nias. Great. Yes, to yes, know yes, that. yes. Very great to know that. Yeah. Very nice. Very I'm nice. an adjunct nice. professor and Nasi senior scientist Wonder. there. Okay. Very good. So he has been kind enough to Thanks. encourage me. To Alex, our pleasure, sir. Yes. Okay. <laughs>
all of you bye okay bye thank you thank you good night everybody good night good night sir bye bye good night Thank you, Rajgopal. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think you are very nice. Thank you, Kamita. लाटपुर तम मोटा हाफ देखा जाउ जी ना तब तो कत ले कहू छ ना नाउ आई थिंक यू हैव बिकम इंफॉर्मल नहीं नहीं तम मोटा हाफ देखा सुजीत रे कते क्लियर एकदम यस यस ओके थैंक यू फ्रॉम माय फील्ड वर्क भाई ना भाई ना कोन आपन देखा जाउ नी रो प्रभु हां नहीं मोटी वो हेल्थ प्रॉब्लम रहउ छ म आ बेसी देखा जाउ नी काई यू हेल्थ प्रॉब्लम ते रहउ छ अच्छा ओके बहुत नमस्कार सुजीत देव पढ़े ले पढ़े ले पढ़े ले अरे इधर डीटा ऑब्जर्वेशन मु मार्क कर लिए थ्रू जितना लेक्चर टा सड़ला ही शुड हैव गिवन मी एटलीस्ट वन मिनट स्टैंड टू प्रेशर इन टू स्पीक समथिंग तो प्रेशर इन टू को चांस दे ले इन्हें <laughs> एक रे अधूरे एक क्लोजिंग करें अपने ही एबी पाने के लिए नीचे क्वेश्चन आम � क्लोज इन दीटा डिविजन नम तंग को बत्ती थाजे ठीक थे ठीक अछि धन्यवाद बहुत धन्यवाद कहि देबा तंग हम कहि देबो तमे व्यस्त होने तमे ठीक ये कर रेस नियो बत्ती तमे ठीक कर छे जे जे अछि राजगोपाल रो सुजीत रो बैकग्राउंड पूरा अछि मुह पूरा देखाय दी बॉडी तमर खाली मुह रा हाथ देखाय न चला हां करेन नथला बतन बतन आसला कर नहीं नहीं तमरो मोहर हाफ देखा जाउ जी जे कहउ छ नहीं आउ दे यो मत पर पूरा से माने कोन कैमरा से माने कैमरा फिट कर से काठे रे तंगर पूरा डाटा देखा जाउ जी सब अच्छी जे बहुत जगह रे कैमरा फिट करले भी हब सेमती तो वर्षा भाईना भाईना कोडी बोल से ना कोडी ये हां अपना मुंह हां हाँ मो बहुत जरा अच्छी जीबी बैंगलोर रो ऐसे टी काम हो चुके हैं आरो इतने डी आरो जी अच्छा ये जो जू जू बैंगलोर जी बारे सर मो मजे रहा ची जू मेरे जो बैकग्राउंड हो हाइड्रोलर रहा चाहे बे हाँ ओहो अच्छा ये जू मेरे जो बैकग्राउंड हो फिट कर जो हाँ तो जेन दास उपचार से लिए कलाम ऑफ कर दो